<laughs> Much louder. Yeah, I'll try. I'll try. So, so in my talk, I'll try to answer these five questions. Is, is everyone here fam already familiar with OpenCL? Because maybe I, I think there are a lot more to talk about OpenCL. I, I don't really know if I should just skip the, the first point and go straight to the current status of uh, implementation. Might as well be the first. Probably we don't know a lot of details of CL. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Okay, so I think I. We don't have a slide. I'm just going to make a short review. Okay. okay, so what's OpenCL? It's an, it's an API <laughs> whose goal is to, to provide. Programming interface a series of primitives whose goal is to offload a part of the computational complexity that will otherwise be handled by a CPU to a different kind of device, like a GPU. But it's not; it's very general. It's not only limited to GPUs. It's kind of, you call, in theory, you could write on anything uh, a select string processor, or a cluster of CPUs, or even a special purpose processor like Utah-style processors. And, Stuff like that. So, in that sense, it's different to, for example, CUDA, that's only limited to GPUs and GPUs from, from some brand of focal. So, okay, so I think the most interesting kind of fighting points of OpenCR are the so called commands, uh, the ones that actually make the device do something. Um, I guess you could divide all of them in three main blocks. Uh, memory transfer, kernel execution, and synchronization commands. Memory transfer are used for moving memory around to upload or download memory from the device or, or from the host. Um, kernel execution are the, uh, the commands that make the device really run some specific function. Kernel is just a fancy name for, for, a, <coughs> for a function that it, that that you can run in the, in the computer device. Um, okay, um, so implementation support what support uh, native and built-in kernels, but they are less interesting. Um, they're only optional features that may or may not be supported uh, by given OpenCL implementation. Uh, okay, so um, OpenCL supports two different execution modes. Uh, in order execution is normal execution mode that one will expect when you when you call several commands in sequence and uh, get executed in the same order that were called. So so none of this will be necessary if you if you use that execution mode. But it, um, it also supports a more general mode that it's called auto for the execution. Uh, in that mode, there are no implicit ordering guarantees. So, so you have to specify the dependencies between all the commands by hand. Like, so, in, in this example, mm, this will run a kernel in the computer device. Uh, uh, the second to last argument is just a list with the event objects this command depends on. So. This specific command will wait until both of these events are signaled. Um, it will not run before. Uh, so, this is a diagram of the uh, execution model that OpenCL assumes. So, mm, it's only um, it's very general, it only assumes that devices are, can be grouped into platforms. Uh, that a platform is just a collection of compute devices that uh, are, usually, are usually implemented by the same, the same vendor. So usually devices from different platforms are, may, have some, may have limitations to talk with each other. So for example, it might be difficult to, to get to share one buffer object with, between devices that 
find different platforms or do a web change, for example, synchronization of the or uh, each computer devices internal components of one or more compute units. A uh, computer unit is just a collection of files, a collection of processing elements. Each one, each processing element is just a as car processor that executes one single thread. Uh, usually threads that get executed in the same computer unit have uh, facilities to communicate with each other, like a shared memory error and some synchronization primitives. Yeah, so in, in, for example, in the cell processor, each you have a power PC call that's called a PP and then you have several synergistic serve processors. Uh, each one each one will map to to a on open CL processing element. Uh, in the case of an um, NVIDIA GPU it gets a bit more complicated, but still it's a very it's a very simplified view of how um, the typical NVIDIA GPU looks like. Uh, so we have, well, uh, the most, <coughs> the, the most mm, serious limitation that, that in the NVIDIA architecture has is that all threads aren't really executed in parallel. Because, well, uh, when, you, when you execute a kernel, the execution domain get, gets divided into, into groups of 32 threads, and each one is called a war. Um, then you have a number of Scala processors of SPs. Um, each one is, is just a, a processor that can execute 32 Scala threads in parallel. But the thing is that each SP has only only one single execution unit, and one single program counter. So it can only execute one instruction at the same time. But it can it can operate in 32 or 32 mm, different different threads if and only if each one of the threads are running the same are in the same point of the program. So in case where different different lanes diverge, the the SP will take one of the two branches at one uh, the other the other threads will stay inactive until the program reconverge. So it's got as color processor but in fact it's like a vector processor because it's can only execute one single vector instruction. Mm -hmm. uh, so, as we can see, uh, like OpenCL intends to support a uh, very wide combination of all the well known part computing architectures. Mm -hmm. Single instruction, multiple data, because, because, like it's the case on NVIDIA hardware, uh, all the processing elements may may not be completely, may not have complete freedom to diverge, and they may not have full parallelism. So, in fact, they might be executed by a vector processor using a single instruction, multiple data scheme. So, but there's also another way because this, this model could be supported is if, for example, each processing element in turn supports some kind of vector instruction architecture. So in that case, each, each processing element, like on each lane here, could will also support uh, vector instructions and could, 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 could um, do the same operation in vectors of four elements or whatever. That's not the case on, on NVIDIA hardware. Uh, then SPMD because um, you different threads running in different, in different compute units or even in some cases different threads running in the same compute unit may have enough files to, to divide and to to visit different different points of the programs at the same time, so so you might be executing <coughs> completely completely unrelated threads of the same program at some point. But it, it's also it's also 
may support, but it's not it's not really enforced by by the specification to support multiple program multiple data. So you can you can for example in theory you can invoke several kernels at the same time and as you have no you you have to give no implicit implicit synchronization guarantees. You can you can the implementation is free to run just run everything in parallel if it's possible. Uh, then in OpenCI you have four different disjoint memory spaces. Mm, global memory is just a normal kind of memory. But, but, mm, all the threads and even more, in, in some cases all the devices in, in the same system share. Because memory is like it's also global, but it's kind of being modified by by kernel running on the computer. Uh, and then Private memory is just an identical copy of the same storage area that is replicated once for each for its thread. And local memory is, is also you also have a number of copies of it. But the difference is that, that it's shared by what what in OpenCL is called a working group. And OpenCL gives you facilities to to set or to decide how large a thread working group is and Home, by how many threads this memory are will be shared. Okay, so I try to make a diagram of what the com compute stack looks like right now. Mm. So, of course, we have the OpenCL client that talks to the OpenCL state tracker. Um, this OpenCL state tracker is what the common word most of the uh, compute specific logic lies. Uh, then there is another half of the, com of the compute specific code that uh, is um, hardware specific and, it, and it's all contained in the, in the pipe journal. Uh, right now the only implementation of, of this is, uh, is for uh, for every five hard every every fifty <coughs> every fifty hard one. Uh, and then we have um, uh, an LVM backend for whose goal is to trans to translate the the output generated the, the to translate the shaders that are supposed to be to be run by the by the computer stack uh, from the LLVM intermediate representation to uh, to another form that all the pipe drivers are able to understand. understand. Uh, right now, the TD side backend for for it is working progress, and well, there's still still quite broken in some some aspects. Uh, anyway. So we can see uh, there's a lot more than this picture could use many improvements because that there's a lot of code being duplicated and uh, stuff being done twice. Like for example we have uh, all the this generic instruction selection and uh, register allocation logic that in theory could be used for example for an N fifty driver. But right now it's or we implemented the game by 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 a code. So it's updated at it's this way. That's a way this way. Uh, so this is a short summary of what the, the changes that I had to do to the to the Gallium API to support compute look like. Um, This has been matched um, to Mesa Master yet um, because I'm not completely comfortable with that code, especially the documentation is still quite lacking. But I hope that it will be soon. Okay, so um, <coughs> now I think I'm going to.
Just like GLX info from OpenCR, it just shows our listing of all the most common devices and platform properties. Uh, I'm just showing the origins, so you can see that I'm not cheating, I'm using the puppet term. Uh, <laughs> It's just a program that simulates a uh, number of bodies, you can have more bodies. Uh, it's all being run in the GPU, like the simulation of the uh, well, The thing is that uh, the problem of simulating n bodies is, has quadratic complexity, so, so in this case you you just make the you, you just make the GPU run the uh, grid of n times n threads, uh, and so so the interaction between all the threads is calculated in part. Uh, as you can see. This is the source code of the, of the program, and it's written in this weird assembly language. <laughs> so, because uh, LVM backend is not mm. really mature in, uh, enough to run this kind of program yet, yeah. it's still not going to um, um, do something. For example, this Ziva program that just has a couple of function calls and some loops in vector arithmetic. For these simple cases, it generates the correct code, but you know, it's really a lot to do for it to be the correct function. I'm gonna get back a, a little bit to the problems I I encounter when trying to implement this thing. Uh, the, the first one, the first problem you will hit when trying to implement OpenCL on top of the Gallium API will be the, um, the its memory model because in in the current model of we have in TDSI we have like a fixed number of resource slots. Uh, if they're in each one right now, there are supposed to be fixed numbers. So in case like this one, for example, in this point of the reference, you, you don't really know from which from which buffer this error pointer is going to come from because it depends on another, use, another parameter that specified by the user, so you can really know it at compile time. So of course, a solution for this will be to um, to uh, assume that a pointer is just a pair of uh, an offset and a resource index. It would be a bit incongruent for, 
for special for GPUs that always support like a continuous address space. So for those cases, it will be best to so it will be best to just have one single address space, and the pipe driver has still a freedom to 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 assume that each pointer is just a bit field of a resource index part and an office and an offset part if fit like but in this way you, you can easily support both both models. <coughs> uh, because otherwise the, th the thing is that if you don't do, do this usually you, you'll need some kind of translation table if if you are if you're trying to, to implement um to implement this slot based addressing on devices that, that use a, a continuous address space, you'll need some kind of translation table from buffer indices to, to memory offset. So it will be a bit of So right now this is the solution I'm using. Another problem will be to to deal with some more that was it. Because right now TGSI is only able to represent to represent um, offsets like uh, um, not really offsets but indices within each re register file. So you aren't really able to to address a single component of a vector. You can only address all vectors in the in the, um, in the memory space you're addressing. So of course you could, we could just say that the global ad address space is different to the other ones and it takes uh, an address instead of uh, an index. I'm not fully very, very fond of that solution. And our solution will be to, uh, to change all the register files to, uh, to byte based addressing. That will be quite an interesting change. Um, there's a lot of code right now that assumes that registers are just numbered by by syntax. So so finally, I decided to to use a simple solution that was to treat the OpenSea address spaces as just like regular resources. So you will use a normal load and store because instead of using this this kind of syntax to 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 store load that data for you. Then I'm not always function calls. Because right now I think all the all the Gallium drivers they don't really so they don't really support function calls, they, they just inline everything. And it's also because of a limitation of the um, GLSL compiler or in, in lines, uh, in, in lines everything. So just, they don't really have a, a chance to to do function calls. But in, in compute, in some cases, it, you really have no choice to, because a uh, function may might be might have to be invoked directly by the host, so you can't really inline it somewhere else if, if it's if it's gonna be used, but if it if it's called by other functions out as well. So anyway, the question of what's best what's best to do if it's to inline a function or to just keep it as as a normal function call. It's going to depend on many factors. But as I said, in some cases you really don't have a choice. Uh, some people are arguing that it will be necessary if we want to support actual function calls in TGSI to somehow expose the function prototypes to, to the assembly language. But that's usually not required for for an assembly language to to be aware of the of the coding conventions of a, of a higher level language you're implementing. 
but uh, I think pretty much all the assembly lines don't know about function polygrams. Mm. But the thing is that, so I just went ahead and implemented it the, the normal way is using a register based coin convention because we don't really have a stack in the TGS side. Finally, I ran into the problem that, that well, this is the solution. <laughs> in, in some cases, like, like this one, the register allocator wasn't able anymore to, to do some optimization it used to. Like, for example, in this case, if, if temp1 is just a temporary value, it's, it will be able to merge temp1 and temp0 to the same physical register. But if we, if once I implemented the function cost, it wasn't anymore because it can't really know if this temp1 is, is going to be used later on by the code or if it's just a um, temporary value. So, so I have well, a simple solution for this was to add a new keyword to, uh, <coughs> to extend a register declaration syntax with a new keyword that will just signal a given register as a local value. So that way, that way the, the compiler is now free to do whatever, whatever it wants with temp1 because because he doesn't have to to give any guarantees about about it being for server calls uh, function value. Then another problem was that in OpenCI we have two different kinds of functions like normal functions and Cameras. Uh, the difference is just that normal functions are only intended for, to be called from other functions, and <coughs> cameras are, are intended to be called directly by the host. So usually you have some some hardware specific way to pass this V and X from the host to the device, and um, it might be there are several possibilities. In some cases, it might be just a constant buffer. That will be initialized by the host and then uploaded to the device, or it might be some some special facilities that Hadoop may may have to initialize a part of the of the thread thread storage with some specific data. Um, the latter is the case in in the fifty Hadoop. So. To, so in the end, uh, I decided to to make the the LLVM backend to make it output um, kind of an <coughs> abstract address space. So in kernels, arguments are loaded from this abstract address space, and it's the responsibility of the pipe driver to reduce or to load this with all the reference to the input address space to to the actual mechanism that would be used by a hardware to access this power. Mm -hmm. Then another problem was control flow. Because in, in most cases, it, mm -hmm. um, most GPUs have problems to deal with arbitrary control flow. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they do it at all. Because in some in some cases it might be implemented as conditional execution. For example, as you have seen in NVIDIA hardware, that, that you have, we always have like a group of threads that don't have full parallels, and so so the GPU has to know where this divergence and convergence point are for for the thread divergence to be dealt dealt with correctly. Uh, in, in other cases, the um, hardware may not support may not support arbitrary branching at all. Uh, so it's nice it's nice for the intermediate representation to to be able to represent a structure control flow as such, and not as a con 
this condition of logic. And in, in, a, uh, in the case of LLVM, all the all branches are always, I mean, all the control flow is always transformed so mm -hmm. condition of branching. So we need some kind of, I need some kind of conversion path to, to structurize the control flow. But because I thought that I, it was a good idea to, to have this logic in the, at a common, in, at a common level and not let every, every path driver write on the same thing. Because it's likely to be useful for many if at all. Another problem was that in OpenCL you you have you have no way to know what the format of an image an image object is until this same uh, until this program is bound to a certain to a certain image object. So for example in this case it could be any format that transformed to a floating point and um, so the the Current the resource declaration syntax we have is not really appropriate for for OpenCL because we don't know if they, they are really stored as floats or something else. Uh, there are some in some hardware there might be a little more fundamental problem with, with this because, for example, in NV50, there you don't really have a notebook like this. Mm -hmm. that will access an image object. You have to actually implement this for the pixel packet and address conversion and so on because uh, as, norm, as, a normal, as normal memory accesses raw pointer as a raw pointer the reference. So you really it will it's it's really, really useful for, for the compiler to know <coughs> what the format of an image object is before the, the code is generated. So the first point, the first thing I had to do was to just simplify the resource declaration syntax. Uh, right now, right now I I solved this problem. Well, I'm not really very happy about the solution I have right now because of the fo the format is determined at runtime. And the thing is that. The, the pipe driver initializes a special constant buffer with a table containing all the all the image objects used by a program, mm -hmm. all the all the um, formats. So depending on the actual format used, uh, the surf surface access of code will take one path or not. So right now, the actual implementation of this this of code in this of code in in the NVIDIA hardware is <coughs> is, is a uh, general of, of conditions so are not really <coughs> efficient. But actually, I, I don't think the proprietary driver does much better than this. It's also quite inefficient <coughs> kind of resource access. But I guess it, the ideal solution will be to, um, to determine all this in, before the program is run. Probably at late time by by maybe factoring out all the the resource resource access and to some kind of standard library that will encapsulate this uh, references to this up to to this to this to this kind of primitive will, will be left unresolved in the program until the 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 image arguments of the kernel are are bound. So at that point, uh, the program will probably undergo some kind of linking pass and um, reference to it will be resolved depending on what the actual format of the image is. Uh, that with the synchronization mode, there's a small <coughs> conflict between the model most, uh, the main model most open source driver has had, have been using, and the OpenCL model, because until now, 
<clears throat> Until now, we most open source drivers there's no no need to to be dealing with event objects from in in user space because uh, each buffer objects each buffer object, object knows where and how it was used last. So in case where a buffer object is used again, uh, they cannot they cannot automatically see whether some kind of synchronization is needed and some kind of bug ha has to be inserted in the, in the command stream. So one might think that or man is just more strict that OpenCL, so there's no need to do anything. We, we could just ignore the event weightings that OpenCL gives us in, within or in every command. But the problem is that in OpenCL there are a different kind of events that are triggered by the user itself. So in that case, um, we can we have to really implement it in, in, soft, in software. Well, it depends. In cases like MD50 or <coughs> even even <coughs> much earlier, Nvidia hardware, the, the, the hardware has, the hardware has a, a synchronization printed that is called a semaphore. Uh, it allows you to make the GPU wait until some kind of external event is becoming signal. But if if the if the if the hardware happens to not support this kind of this kind of synchronization primitives, then it will be very annoying for it to 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 do the same thing in software if, if it doesn't want to run into that much. So it's it's not really complicated logic but it's tricky to get right. So um, in the end I this um this synchronization logic was implemented in software because in the at a common level because um, anyway the um, overhead is in two bits so I think it makes sense to do it at a common level. And then this wasn't really a problem at all in the end. There's a, a lot of people, it, it, it was assumed by a lot of people for a long time that compute required constant virtual addresses. But it's not really, it's not really the, the case in, at least not in OpenSea for CUDA it might be. But in OpenSea there's really no way because well, the thing is that in OpenCL, the, the uh, kernel has no internal state, and it keeps no state between one execution and another. So it can't really mm, memorize the address of a buffer object from previous invocations. So, and there's also no way to assign a value to a pointer that's not already a pointer. So. In, in the end, in OpenCL, all the pointers you have, they always have to come from arguments that have been exp explicitly bound to the before, immediately before the kernel was involved. So, <coughs> so in fact, in OpenCL, there's, there's really no need for constant virtual addresses, or um, there's also no need for the hardware to support virtual memory for it to run OpenCL. But anyway, in the world, we do support constant virtual addresses now, but it, again, it's not going to be useful for a computer, or not as useful as some expected. And well, these two problems are really computer specific problems, but because they affect graphic applications in one way or another. <laughs> But anyway, there are, I, I guess there are the most serious limitations that the current implementation has. The first one is that in many cases, the, 
compute programs are running in headless servers. So they it doesn't really make any sense to have an next server line there. Uh, at this moment, authentic um, authentication is, is handled by the X server. So it's if yeah, it's the X server that decides if a given process gets direct access to a to a hardware device, to a graphics device, to them. Uh, for the demos, I uh, just want I just um, I just modified the, the kernel to disable this this authenticated check. So that's the reason I could run as an uh, unprivileged user. But uh, normally, it's, that will be the case. Uh, I don't think just doing what I just did is a satisfactory solution because in some in some setups it might it might be a security it might have some security implications because one user might be able to access access all the other users shared buffers. Uh, it, it's only a well, for it's a, it's not really a big problem in in the world because because we have separate address spaces for which process. Mm, but still one user will be able to to, to map into the into its virtual memory space the buffer objects of another of another user. As long as long as those um, buffers have been previously explicitly um, shared by the other user, so it, so in some cases uh, one um, a user will be able to, to get access to to the front buffer from of the DOI front buffer of another user. Uh, I think that the most most elegant solution for this problem will be a link to API that was proposed by Christian Hertzberg some time ago. I'm not really sure what is it's not in this room right now, right? Correct. What is the instant questions? Yeah. Yeah. But, mm, I'm not really sure what happened with this proposal. It will let one process decide which is which process, which other processes are buffer is, uh, is 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 it okay to ch to share? So so for example, the X server will will only let those processes that legitimately need the the buffer for something, and not other processes to to actually get access of the contents for the share. Buffer. Um, The other problem is the GPU synchronization, because in OpenCL context might be that you can create a context on several devices at the same time. Uh, right now, it's very problematic because most drivers, well, all the drivers are actually, they are just unable to to talk. If you have several, even if you have several instances of the same of the same device. One instance is not able to to um, to talk to another one, so this doesn't really work yet. It's not lot of four. I guess uh, we'll need some kind of mechanism for for a driver to tell and um, to instruct other driver to to, for example, migrate a buffer of it from its video memory to some kind of shared aperture or to system memory and also some mechanism for one driver to, to instruct another one to for example um, signal the completion of some fine subject of, of, of some GPU event by <coughs> writing, writing some specific value to some given location in the shared aperture. And then there's an LLVM backhand with uh, in a I would say that there's still more than, I don't really know for sure, but at least three three and eight hundred hours of works and fun to do in the end So there's still a long way to go. 
Sure, when it's ready. Yeah. Um, 